If you want to turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, we'll read a few verses there, and then I'll address the topic of uh, praying for our loved ones and how we should do so. So I'm reading from the ESV. As Paul writes to the church in Corinth, he writes, he says, But I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. And even now, you are not yet ready, for you are still of the flesh. For while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, well, I follow Apollos, are you not being merely human? What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you believed, as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. He who plants and he who waters are none, are one, pardon me, and each will receive his wages according to his labor. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. I'll only read to verse 9 for now. Brothers and sisters, as we look at this passage, I need to state right from the onset that I will not preach the very message that this passage has been given to us for. <laughs> Let me explain. As Paul writes this, he's writing to the church in Corinth, and there's obviously some division within the congregation. Some are following Paul, some are following Apollos, and Paul now needs to focus on this problem that exists in the church. So he rebukes them for this divisiveness that exists in the church, and he encourages them to, to make sure that they understand that neither Paul nor Apollos is anyone unless the Lord does the work. So Paul's concern is this divisiveness. Is that the right English word, or is it divisiveness? Divisiveness. You, you can correct me. I'm not, I'm not an, a native English speaker. Um, so in this church, you had these cliques, these groups within the congregation, factions, and they were those people who attached themselves to Paul because Paul preached the gospel first to us, and we like Paul, we like his style, we like the way that he led us into, into the kingdom. And then there are those who followed Apollos because we like Apollos more. He's a better Bible teacher than Paul. He's, more, he's far more relatable than Paul. Whatever the case might be, you find in this congregation these two groups. So pride and prejudice are not Jane Austen's invention. It was actually present already in the church because people's hearts are usually like that. You and I could so easily attach ourselves to those people we like more than others. In Corinth, this manifested itself with some boasting in Paul and others boasting in Apollos. So Paul needs to address this within the congregation. And as he does so, he does it in a very subdued, sensitive way by calling them out as not being spiritual, but acting as people in the flesh. He says they are like infants. In other words, they are like those who cannot take solid food yet, acting like 10-year-olds who are still on mother's milk. This is not subtle at all. Paul really rebukes them, saying you are, you are fleshly. You are acting in a way that Christians should not act. This is not subtle. And the reason he does this is, for us, is given for us in verse 3. Verse 3, Paul says, For while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? So this immaturity within the congregation manifests itself in this, in this unhealthy attachment or these unhealthy alliances to the human instruments, and that's important, the human instruments that the Lord God used in their journey of faith. Now, I don't know most of you. I know some of you, and I, I most certainly don't know who brought you into the faith, as it were, those people who you listen to when they preach the gospel to you. Many of you might be Christians today because of your parents. I hope many of you are. Or faithful parents teaching their children 
the things of the Lord. Some of you might have come to faith because of someone at university speaking to you or at work. Whatever the case might be, our journeys into the faith through the human instruments that God uses can be very, very different. And I hope you have some affection to those people who led you to faith because that's good. But I hope you don't attach your salvation to the person who preached the gospel to you. But you look beyond that, and that is what Paul does here. He looks beyond himself and beyond Apollos, and he says that, yes, I preached the gospel. You heard it from me. You came to faith, and yes, Apollos, he watered your, your faith, as it were. He nurtured you in sanctification. But at the end, salvation belongs to the Lord. So that's the text as we see Paul deals with this within this congregation. It's about this division caused by tribal pride, focused on men and not focusing on God. Paul reminds them then, and he says, I want you to look beyond Paul. I want you to look beyond Apollos. And may I ask you to look beyond any human instrument when it comes to the salvation of lost souls. Look beyond them and look at the Lord God who saves. Because we read that in verse 7. So, Neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. It is only God who gives the growth. And it is here, brothers and sisters, where I want to take the principle behind Paul's argument as he, as he explains to them not to have these cliques or these, these factions within the church. He says that's wrong. But the reason behind it is Paul understands that it is foolish for us to hold on to human instruments and forget that it's God who saves. And I hope that as I explain these things to you tonight, that we will apply that in our prayer afterwards as we pray for our lost family members, our lost friends and colleagues, as, as Logan mentioned. So what is the principle? principle we find in verse 7 and in verse 9. The human agents, in this case Paul and Apollos, are nothing. They, their part in the salvation and nurturing of these saints in Corinth was the mere instrument that the Lord used to accomplish that which the Almighty God wanted to do in the life of these believers in Corinth. So, verse 7, So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. And then if we look at verse 9, the same thing is repeated, For we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field, you are God's building. These verses, brothers and sisters, represent for us which the whole of Scripture testifies about our God. Think about that. From the moment you open the Bible, you have God speaking to us, God revealing Himself to us, God saying that I am the creator of the ends of the earth. There was nothing and now there is. In the beginning, God created. And from Genesis onwards, we see God's relationship with man. And even after man rebelled and sinned, it is God who reaches out in grace and love and mercy, undeserving to man, and yet God does that because God is a God who saves. And when you read the history as, as Adam's race becomes a nation in Abraham and his descendants and Moses and you have Judah and Israel and the whole history up until the point of Jesus Christ, we see all throughout Scripture that God makes a way for his people to be saved. And he saves. He gives them sacrifices to offer. He gives them a temple to worship. He gives them priests to intercede for him. He gives them kings to rule over them according to his will and his word. And he gives them prophets to speak to them and to call them to repentance. Let me just go through some of these verses. They are like thousands more. But just listen how often we read in the Bible that God saves. That shouldn't be a surprise to us. But Psalm 68, verse 19 and 20, we read, Blessed be the Lord who daily bears us up, God is our salvation. Our God is a God of salvation. And to God, the Lord, belong deliverance from death. So tie those truths very tightly in your mind, because later on we'll see how important these are. God saves. God is a God of salvation. God is the God of our salvation. And the God, the Lord, belong to Him alone, belong deliverance from death. 
Isaiah 12, verse 12. I love Isaiah 12. Beautiful little chapter there in the middle of the book. Well, not in the middle, probably a quarter way through, but just a lovely, beautiful chapter. And in there we read the following. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and I will not be afraid. For the Lord God is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 17, we read, The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. Matthew, now we're in the New Testament, Matthew 1, 21, she will bear a son. You remember, that's the story of Mary. And then we hear, she will bear a son, and you shall call his name what? Jesus, which means what? God saves. For he will save his people from their sins. And then 1 Timothy 1, uh, Logan already mentioned it, verse 15, this saying is trustworthy. In other words, you can, you, you can, we don't bet, but you can bet your life on this one, all right? Because it is a trustworthy saying that Jesus Christ saves. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost, said Paul. So with very little effort, you can find hundreds and thousands of more verses in the Bible speaking about the fact that God saves. He saves his people. When you think of it, this is the message of the whole Bible. It is the message of the whole Bible. And it is revealed for us in the fact that Jesus Christ comes. He is the mediator. And in his mediatory work, he is prophet, he is priest, and he is king. Why? So that you can be saved. So that your family members who you are going to pray for tonight are going to be saved. So that those colleagues at work can be saved. God saves. He came to save those who are lost. And he alone can do it. But the fact that the Son of God assumed our human nature, he suffered, he died, and he rose from the dead, says more, says more than only that God can save. It's easy to say God can save because we believe God is almighty. Of course God can save. Of course he can save. But it says more than only he can save. It says that God's very nature is a God who saves. When we pray tonight, we're not going to pray and ask things of God that is outside of his nature or his will or his desire. It is God's nature to show mercy. It is God's nature to be full of grace and full of love. And he effectually saves those whom he loves. It is God's decreed will that sinners will be saved. We read in scripture that God has elected a people for himself. He predestines them to be conformed into the image of his son. He's done that. This is all done because God saves. And then in time, he calls them, and then he justifies them, and then he sanctifies them. Maybe that justification could use a human instrument, or the call could use an instrument like Paul and Apollos. Maybe the sanctification process involves men and women in our lives like Apollos. But at the end, it is he who justifies and it is he who sanctifies. And ultimately, it is he who glorifies as well. All this while we were sinners. What kind of people does God save? Well, every kind, <laughs> even your kind. He saved me. He saved you. It doesn't matter whether you are rich, whether you are poor. It doesn't matter what tribe you are from. It doesn't matter what language you speak. God saves that's what God does. And we have this picture in the book of Revelation. In Revelation 4 and 5 in particular, you have, you have this crowd gathered around the throne of God from all nations, tribes, and tongues. Why? Because God saves people from all nations, tribes, and tongues. But you know, that can sound a little bit remote to us. God can, God can save, of course. We, we kind of believe that. And he often does save. We, we, we know that. But you and I tonight have the faith to believe and truly trust that the Lord will hear our prayers when we pray that God will save that one family member or that colleague or that friend. 
do we trust that God can save them? When you pray tonight for your husband or your daughter or your son or your wife or that friend, no matter how many sins they have accumulated against them, how big the guilt is that they carry, they cannot be too sinful, too hardened of heart, too far outside of the purview of God's grace and mercy to be saved because God saves. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4, and 4 to 7. Just, I mean, we can camp in Ephesians forever, can't we? He says this, verse 4, But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. I like how Paul just, by grace you have been saved, puts it in there, so that no Catholic can ever be confused. <laughs> and he raised us up with him, and listen to this, he raised us up, uh, you study grammar, you know it better than me, I'm sure you do. What tense is that? He raised us up. Isn't it past tense? He raised us up together with him and he seated us together with him. Again, what tense is that? It's again past tense. He raised us up. He seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. It means that that salvation that God has given you has placed you already alive for the future that awaits you after you die so that you can know for sure that when God saves, He saves you completely and He saves you to be with Him for all eternity in the heavenly places together with Him. Verse 7, He says, So that in the coming ages He might show the immeasurable riches of His grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. I wonder today when I looked at this again, the coming ages, what would that be? It can be one or two things, really. The coming ages could be the age in which we live today. From the time when Paul wrote this, we are an age that came later. It could also mean the age to come. That time when we are in the presence of God and this world as we know it is gone. And for all eternity, in the presence of God, you would look upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And as you look at him, you see the slain lamb. You see his wounds. You see the one who was pierced for your transgressions. And in him, you will know the immeasurable riches and the grace and the kindness that God has shown you and me and those whom we're going to pray for. That's remarkable. So let's take all that together and make just a few, um, I think, practical ways for us to think about this as we pray tonight. Number one, God uses natural or human means to save sinners. God did use Paul and Apollos and all the other apostles and all the evangelists and, and mothers and fathers and friends who have evangelized throughout the ages. This even includes your prayers tonight. God used the means of our prayers to save sinners. But it also means that our prayers cannot be rendered to God without them being accompanied with the obedience that we are called to do as God calls us to evangelize. It would be foolish of us and probably um, a misunderstanding of Scripture if we go tonight and we become all hyper-Calvinists and we just pray because God saves, that's what the pastor said, that's what the text said, so we will just pray and God will just save and that's it. That's one of the means that God uses is our prayers, but God also uses the means of evangelism. So as we pray tonight, I pray for you as a church and for myself and our church too, that as we pray, it would it would almost spark within us a desire to go to those people that we pray for and maybe share the gospel one more time with them this coming week, especially if you pray for family members and friends or people that you see often. So we cannot divorce our prayer from the commands the Lord has given us. So it's pray and go, go preach, teach and testify to the great and wonderful person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's number one. God uses natural or human means 
to save sinners. Number two, God alone saves. That's what our text says. The salvation of those that we will be praying for tonight completely depends on the Lord's work. You can pray, you can evangelize, and no one can be saved. <laughs> as you pray, as you evangelize, and if someone then comes to faith, we don't stand and say, it's because I pray, or oh, it's because I'm such a good evangelist, but it is because we know that it is God who saves. God must get the glory. Not Paul's, not Apollos, not my, nor your effort can make any difference were it not for the Lord using the means that he has given us in prayer and evangelism to work through that his will and his purposes in our lives. It does not depend, therefore, tonight on your eloquent prayers. It does not depend whether you have zeal in your evangelism. It doesn't even depend on the sincerity of your efforts when you pray or when you evangelize for someone to be saved. All those are good, and hopefully that is part of our Christian experience, that we, that we do pray with sincerity and we do evangelize with zeal. But brothers and sisters, it is God who will save, not you and me. He alone does this. That inner call, that, that work that the Holy Spirit does to make alive that which is dead in trespasses and sins is something that only God can do. And especially for you who might have children who are unsaved. You've, you've had them in your home. They grew up. They heard the Bible being taught to them. They heard you speak to them about faith. And yet they grew up into adults. And maybe still even to this day, they do not know Christ and have no desire to follow him. Tonight we're going to pray that the Lord might save them. Because he does save sinners such as these. So pray to him who alone can save. Number three, God is willing to save. We sometimes forget that God is willing to save sinners because if this was not the case, none of us would be here tonight. If God wasn't willing to save me or you, we wouldn't have been here. God wants us also to pray for the salvation of lost souls tonight. He loves the prayers of his children. He loves it when we come together and say, Lord, your will is for people to be saved, and therefore I want to pray that your will be done. So, know tonight for sure, with confidence, that as you pray, that God is not reluctant to save sinners. You and I are not going to beg God to save sinners. We're not going to be on our knees until it bleeds and say, God, look, I'm bleeding here. You don't need to do that. You come to God and you know that God is willing to save sinners. He's not reluctant to save sinners. He calls them out with the gospel as it goes out into the world. And he saves sinners such as you and I once were. Now we're sinners but saints. Number four, it is God's will for sinners to be saved. Now there's a little bit of a difference here between God is willing and it is his will. The difference between this and the previous point is that when we say that God is willing to save, we refer to his acts. He's willing to save me. He, he's willing for my heart to be changed. But when we say that it is God's will to save, we are referring to God's decree in salvation. God decrees that sinners will be saved. He decrees that salvation will reach those whom he has elected to be his own. How election works, I don't know. It's clear in scripture. <laughs> I don't know. On what basis would God decide that some would be saved and others won't be saved? I don't know. I know this though, that God has a people whom he elected and upon whom he would put his saving grace in time because he has predestined them to be conformed into the image of the Son. And he will call them, he will justify them, he will sanctify them, and they will be glorified. So in other words, God is both willing to do it, but God, it is also God's will that it will happen. So tonight, again, when we pray, we must pray with confidence. 
and yet with humility. And when you add to your prayers, Lord, not my will be done, but yours, we are praying according to his will, his decreed will, that sinners will be saved. Firstly, we're almost done. The Lord has a field and he has a building and he will build it and he will make it grow. And that's what we read in verse 7 and 9. Salvation, dear brothers and sisters, belong to the Lord. So that all the honor and all the glory and all the praise forever and ever will belong to him, to no man. God is a jealous God. I love how Ephesians 2, 7 puts it. He puts it all into this perspective when Paul says that God is rich in mercy. He's rich in his grace. He saves us. He makes us alive in Christ. And then he places us together with him in the heavenly realms, in the heavenly places, pardon me. And then he says he does this for this reason, so that the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in the Lord Jesus Christ will be made known. I love that. So pray tonight that the immeasurable riches and the immeasurable grace and love and kindness that God has shown you will also be experienced by those whom you will be praying for tonight. We pray for people whom we love. If I get it right, if you pray tonight for lost family members, I'm sure you love them. If you have a son or a daughter who does not follow Christ, there is no deeper pain for a parent a Christian parent that is, and to know that that son or that daughter might face eternity under the wrath of God instead of understanding the riches and the mercy and the grace of God that you and I have experienced. We're going to pray because our hearts go out to them with compassion. In Christ, they will know that God saves he will be saved by the blood of Christ. They will have his praise on their lips. They will have their hearts filled with thankfulness and adoration. And they will be able to cry out together with us, Our Lord God saves. Hallelujah. Brothers and sisters, I hope that encourages us tonight to pray. Um, please pray. Pray for your your husbands or your wives who are not, uh, your husband or your wife, not, not plural. You know what I mean. Pray for your sons and daughters, your brothers and sisters. And pray for that, that colleague at work that you might have shared the gospel with a few times and yet they haven't showed any interest. Or that friend whom you grew up with maybe in school. Again, you shared the gospel so many times and you might have given up. Don't give up. God saves. It is his will. He decreed for salvation to happen. And he uses us as human means to accomplish his will. Thank you. Shall I pray now and then we'll... <coughs> Heavenly Father, this is no small thing to think and to meditate upon this glorious truth that Jesus saves the very nature of our God whom we worship has been revealed to us in Scripture and even in our own experience that I who was once a sinner, I am now united in Christ and I will face eternity with hope, with joy and with a thankfulness that would last for all eternity because we will see the wounds of the Lord, our Savior, who died for our sins. Until then, Lord, we, we roam around on this earth. And we have family members and people we love and care for who do not know you. And God, death is never far away. Death can always be just around the corner. And then those people who do not know you will face eternity forever in an everlasting fire under the judgment and condemnation of a God who is holy and a God whom they have rejected. 
And Lord, we can, we can probably in our hearts say, yeah, you deserve that. But God, we deserve that until your grace and your mercy reached us. So, Father, tonight as we pray, oh, Lord, hear our prayers and save sinners. We ask this for the glory and the beauty of your name. Amen.